Well, good morning, everybody, and, and thank you for getting up and traveling and trying to find a parking place on the campus, which is probably your biggest challenge of the morning so far. Um, can we turn off the site? I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Well, after we're sure we're moving along here. Okay. Um, yes, I. I wanted to start out, I guess, basically talking about some of the things that uh, we're not knowing about honeybees and we're learning. Uh, when I was a youngster in high school, I had decided maybe I should be an entomologist. Uh, but I had one problem, and I said to my folks, you suppose by the time I get through school and get a degree, they'll know everything there is to know about insects? Well, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, it hasn't happened with honeybees. So I'll do a little introduction here. It's going to be followed by a number of different speakers that will be a little bit more focused on, on their topics than I'm going to be. But I'm hoping that you will uh, find some of these things that uh, we talk about sometimes in honeybees to be a little bit out of the ordinary and new for you. And all I have to do is figure out how this should go. <laughs> oh, there. Okay. Since ancient times, people have looked at the honeybee and said, oh, look at that. Isn't that marvelous? Uh, they do a whole bunch of things in those hives. And, and they seem to divide themselves into little groups to do those jobs. And they don't fight over who's doing the jobs or not doing them. And uh, they seem to accomplish these tasks without too much trouble. But you know, if you sit at the front of a hive, on a busy day and watch what's going on. It makes you wonder how they can get anything done. Because they crawl over each other, they bump into each other, they knock each other over, they knock each other out of the air. It is just incredible to see that going on and think, and they're accomplishing something inside. Well, they are. <laughs> Believe it or not. <clears throat> now, I would guess that the first people that took a good look at a honeybee colony were male. Because they were convinced that one big individual in there was a king. <laughs> it took them a while to find out different. And it turned out that it was a queen. The queen is the only individual that is, is genetically set up and should last for longer than one year. And in fact, if you look back into the records, three years, four years, five years are a possibility if she doesn't build up too large a colony each year. Uh, but just as a side note, our commercial beekeepers right now are having so much trouble with their bees that many of them have to purchase queens in the spring and six months later purchase another one and requeen everything or else the colony won't even make it through a year. They just lose their queens. And we don't know why that is. That's one of the things we still have to look into. Uh, during the spring build-up time, uh, late March, April, May, around here, the queen is probably laying somewhere near 2,000 eggs a day. And in order to do that, she has to be fed an awful lot of food, as you might guess. So we'll talk about the feeding when we get to the workers. Uh, the queen secretes pheromones. And the one that's the most important is called queen substance. That's like a perfume. The queen, when she gets to the right age, flies out and mates with 12 to 20 drones. And it comes back to the colony. And if she doesn't even, if she doesn't swarm, uh, or the colony doesn't take off, taking her with it. She's never even going to fly again. Uh, she holds all these sperm in a little, little bucket inside called the spermatheca, and as they're needed to fertilize eggs, they're metered out so that she can do it. Now, as long as the queen's in pretty good shape and she's giving off this pheromone, the bees in the colony just go about doing their things. If something happens to her, uh, she's damaged, her pheromone level goes down, then they'll rear a new queen. Okay, how about those drones? Well, those are male bees, <clears throat> and during this time of the year, it might not be surprising if either they're being kicked out of the hive or they've already been kicked out. Uh, you can have from none to hundreds in that colony, depending on the time of the year. The males, interestingly, deliver sperm that have identical genetics. Every single sperm is the same. And the reason for that is the drone is haploid. He's only got half a set of chromosomes. That's what he was born with, and that's what he passes along. So uh, he 
is a, a unique individual, but this isn't terribly unique just to honeybees. There are a lot of insects where the males are only haploid, so that's, that's interesting. Um, how does the queen then know when and where to lay these unfertilized eggs? Because she can't control that. Well, the answer is generally, the comb size is what we'll call worker comb size for most places, but there's a few places where the cells are a little larger in diameter. And she detects that as she's searching around looking for a place to lay. And she'll lay one fertilized egg in that bigger cell, and they'll raise a drone. So the drone larvae are fed just like the worker larvae and like the queen. And uh, they go through a larva, pupa, and then emerge as an adult. The drones have to eat to build themselves up. And they have to stay warm so that there's sperm will mature. And at about the age of 10 days or so, then they are capable of mating. And if it's that time of the year when there's likely to be virgin queens flying around that need to be mated, the drones will go out at some time of the day, fly around, look for them, and they come back later. Uh, but the drones don't feed themselves too often in the hive. Their sisters feed them. So if it happens that the drones are flying around, catch up with the queen and mate with her, they die in the act and fall to the ground with a smile on their face. <laughs> if they don't happen to catch up with the queen somewhere, they're going to die of old age at around 35 days. Usually, like I said, up to a couple hundred or something in a colony. But the queen breeders, who are special beekeepers that uh, stay north of us here in the Sacramento Valley, have to have a lot more drones than that because they're rearing thousands and thousands of queens. So they have to have extra drones. You can actually purchase some foundation, as we call it, that you put in the frame, and it's all drone comb. So the bees draw the wax out, and then there's all those cells in there that can be drones. And the queen will get in there and lay those things full. And now we're having thousands of drones in the colony. Okay, so the worker bees vary in number from a low in the winter of, let's say, 10,000 to 15,000, somewhere around there, to a high in the summer of 45,000 to 60,000. I think around here, we probably are closer to the 45,000. Up in Canada, and for whatever reason, you know, where it's cooler and whatnot, that's where you get slightly bigger populations, or even significantly bigger, that's where you get to 60,000. Okay, the workers I hash from a fertilized egg, and as I mentioned before, it's in the quote, normal cell size. <laughs> Their life expectancy depends upon what time of the year they are born and what's going on in the hive. So during the spring, summer, and fall time, when brood rearing is going on, the bees go through a succession of different little jobs that they're doing, but the critical one is when they're in their second week they eat a lot of pollen, digest it, get the nutrients in their blood. The nutrients are taken up by two sets of, of glands in the head, and they just ooze out this, this material that some books will mistakenly call royal jelly. It's brood food. And if you modify it with proteins and some other things, extra sugar, then it becomes royal jelly. But you get the idea, it's this gelatinous stuff, and it's just, it's just coming out of them. And they go around and they feed the larvae. And the larva never moves, it just, goes around in a circle at the back of the cell and, and feeds as the bees put food in front of it. So they're visited over and over and over. And the bigger the larvae get, the faster they can eat. So they really get visited a lot right up there when they're just about full grown. If, however, there isn't any brood to feed, we're going now into the winter time, uh, the honeybees get themselves in a state where nutritionally they're kind of set up to do some brood rearing, but they don't do any brood rearing, so they just have a nice persistent lifespan and they can go up to six months and that's what gets the colony through the winter, especially in places where they can't find any food during the winter, like Minnesota where they're buried under snow, which is where they're might be keeping. So the workers, during the first three weeks, we already mentioned this, eat the pollen, they build up, uh, they clean and polish cells, they uh, eat sugar, and wax comes out of glands. The, the sugar is converted to wax in glands in their abdomens, and they pull off these little scales that kind of look like, I don't know what a goldfish scale looks like, but I think that's what it looks like. It's white. And they take this up and build the combs out of it, and before long, we'll call them contaminants, but things get into the wax, and it starts to get that typical beef wax color. Um, and then I mentioned that the eat the pollens and convert that into food. Now the interesting thing is down near the bottom there, 
In six days, that larva gets a thousand times bigger. In terms of a human being, if somebody had an eight-pound baby and it grew that fast, six days later, they would have a four-ton child. <laughs> Honeybees have, normally have a few spare individuals that can be used to defend the colony if there's a problem. And even if they die in the act, uh, there's still plenty of bees left to take care of things. So these uh, social groups of wasps and bees are likely to become defensive if they get rattled too much. Uh, but for laboratory purposes, it's really interesting that you can go out into one of these hives and brush all the bees off bring the comb in and put it in the incubator, and 24 hours later go in and brush those bees off, and those zero to 24 hour old bees, A, cannot sting, and B, cannot fly. So you can do all sorts of things and experiments on them, putting marks on them and doing all sorts of things so that you know which ones they are, get them into wherever they're going, and then watch out, because the next day they can fly, the next day they can sting, and the venom increases over the next few days. Um, there's some in there that take on a job called guard bees. And they normally hang around wherever there's an opening in the hive. Now, hopefully, if your hive is in good condition, you've only got an opening in one spot. That's the entrance, as we call it. And they're down there by that entrance. And they're paying attention to the environment, sorry, to see what's going on. And if they're appropriately stimulated, they will then give off what we call an alarm pheromone. It smells exactly like bananas because it's the same chemical. And that gets waved through the hive and it alerts the bees inside that there's something going on outside. Well, fortunately, most of the bees don't pay attention, but there's this small portion of the bees in there that I refer to as soldier bees that are old enough to be foragers, but they're hanging around the hive with nothing better to do. Well, this gives them something to do. So with our European honeybees, they run out to the entrance to take a look and see what's going on. If you know this about honeybees and they're European honeybees, if you stand perfectly still, probably nothing's going to happen. Because the next thing that those soldier bees want is movement. So if you are there, and if you're moving, if you're working with the colony, or if you're <laughs> running away, whatever, uh, you're likely to get stung because now you're moving. That's, that's what they're looking for. Just in case you go down in Southern California where the Africanized honeybees are, don't stand still there. <laughs> They don't stop at the entrance to look at what's coming out or what's going on outside. They just come out and sting the first thing they can hit. When they sting, the sting stays in you, the bee flies away. Now your arm smells like banana and it marks you as a target for the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. How many stings can you get out of a normal colony? Well, the ones around here, uh, if you don't beat them up too badly, probably between 12 and 20 or so, and that's about it. If, uh, but those Africanized honeybees once in a while get a little bit too defensive and 2,000 or more stings can come out of one colony. So you don't want to hang around and see whether or not which kind they are and how many stings you're going to get. Okay, this is a picture of a honeybee in that position where the odor of the sting is being released and she is spreading this stuff out, trying to convince the other bees that there is a problem. So that's guard bee emitting a large pheromone. That was a fun picture to take. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, we mentioned the movement. We mentioned Africanized bees. I've got to get myself here, it's okay. And um, yes, the sting that's embedded in whatever happened to be stung has backwards pointing barbs on it like a harpoon. And it, when it pulls out of the bee, it brings out part of the exoskeleton, it brings out some muscles, it brings out some nerves, it brings out the venom sac. So this, this thing actually slowly digs its way, because there's two pieces of slime on each other, deeper and deeper into the flesh, and periodically gives a little squirt of venom. And this will go on for 45 to 60 seconds if you let it. And all that does, of course, is give you more venom, and more venom, and more venom, which means this thing's gonna last a little bit longer. Uh, so how do you get rid of it? Well. Here it would say scrape it off or wipe it off, which is fine. If you watch beekeepers, what they tend to do is they start getting stung on the hand. They just wipe it off. I mean, they just put the back of the hand and kind of wipe it off on their pants, you know, and keep going. And that usually does it. Uh, you could use a hive tool if, if you got one of those, and they're in the back, the equipment's in the back. 
Uh, but there's an old wives tale out there about, well, you can't just grab it with your forefinger and your thumb and squeeze it, because if you do that, you'll empty the whole vam sac into yourself. So of course, somebody had to test that. So down at UC Riverside, they tested it. And basically what they found out was it doesn't matter if you reach down there with your thumb and your finger and grab that mechanism and, and pull it out of there, or if you scrape it off or you do whatever. The thing that's critical is get it off as quickly as possible. And how doesn't matter. That's what they found out down there. I'm glad I wasn't in that experiment. Okay, so the embedded stick is still there. It smells like bananas. It marks you. But what about the poor bee? You can't have that much of your abdomen yanked out and, and not pay the price. So she's not going to last too much longer. But interestingly, um, for the period of time that she's still functional, she'll then fly around and swat you in the face some more, suggesting here comes another bee to sting. She can't. She already did it. But that happens. And then usually, if the bees are really getting cantankerous, you close up the hive and you walk away. And when you walk away, the bees are flying around. But you know, you, you walk a little bit further, and pretty soon there's only a few. And I admit that even with European honeybees, there's one or two that'll follow you for quite a distance. But Africanized honeybees, once that odor is in the air, they'll follow you for up to a quarter of a mile. And that's bunches of them flying around, giving you a hard time. So best bet with Africanized honeybees, if you can do it, is to get yourself into some kind of either a vehicle or a building or something like that. You're going to bring some with you, but those few are a lot better than the rest of the bunch. Okay, so what are the bees up to? Well, there's uh, three things that are important to the bees. They're similar to our needs, too, nutritionally. Uh, they need water. We need water daily. We'll get dehydrated. Uh, they use it to dilute concentrated food. Honey is a concentrated food. That jelly that they produce is a concentrated food. So they have to thin that food down so the larvae can eat it and they can feed it to the queen. The, the brood nest, as we call it, is that area within the hive. And it can be a small area in the wintertime, and it can be boxes and boxes in the summertime, where the eggs, larvae, and pupae are being reared. That has to remain at a specific relative humidity, or else the bees dry out and die. Also, they have to be at a particular temperature. So if it happens to get too cold, bees are always creating heat in their bodies. And they can pump that up. And they can make their bodies get real warm, and then they can press against the wax, and it will warm up that area of the comb. So the bees can keep that brood area at about 94 to 95 degrees. And they do. All the time there's brood in there, that's the temperature they keep it at. There are some times out here in California when the air temperature outside is just about the same as the brood nest temperature ought to be. They don't have very much work to do. But there's other times when it gets really, really hot out here. And it would cook the brood. So under those circumstances, the bees have to go get droplets of water, put them in various places in the hive, fan over them, and through evaporative cooling, keep the hive air conditioned and keep the brood in that range. They don't care so much about the honey and some of the other things in there. So in the winter in Minnesota, the honey in the tops of the hives, the top boxes that the bees will eventually be moving up to eat during the winter time can be basically at ambient temperature. Honey doesn't freeze like a rock, but it can get that cold. And so you know, they don't worry so much about keeping the rest of the hive space you know, at a critical temperature. It's just that brood nest area. They collect nectar um, from flowers mostly from flowers. Uh, and it can be used for water substitutes. So they can use it to dilute food. They can use it for uh, high air conditioning. But it is a dilute sugar solution. And they can condense that into honey and store it for later use. And Brian will come up and explain that whole thing to you. It's a fascinating story. Uh, pollens are the health food. And you can see the list, I don't have to read it down there in the bottom, but everything that you and I think of as good for your, your health is in pollen. Does that mean that pollen's a real good food for people? Well, that certainly can be debated. Um, I'm not going to say, <laughs> I'm not going to say yes, but um, there's, there's a lot of studies, you know, has, does pollen even get, get digested if, if humans eat it? All those various questions. But for the sake of the bees, that is where they get their health food. The honey is just carbohydrate, that's their junk food. But it's their energy source, they need it because they, they require a lot of energy. Um, 
they, they, honeybees need the same amino acids that we tend to need in our diet. And generally, there's no one particular plant out there that's giving them a pollen that's just what they need in their diet. Uh, generally, they need a mix of pollens coming in in order to get uh, what they need. Let me just jump ahead quickly here. No, okay. So, the bees have to find these various pollens and bring them in from, from distances. And on a daily basis, when the bees are really actively rearing brood, they're going to need about an acre equivalent of blossoms to visit day after day after day. Now, in order to find that, obviously, they have to search because generally, you haven't got an acre of food just sitting in one spot ready to eat. You will have an almond, but normally you don't find that. So bees can and do fly up to four miles away from the hive foraging. And if you use four miles as a radius of a circle, then that hive has the capability of covering a 50 square mile area for the bees in the hive in order to collect enough mixed pollens to meet their nutritional needs. And that's one of the big problems that the bees and the beekeepers have is where do I put my bees where there's that kind of food? Because as you see out here in the summer, especially in California, Central Valley and whatnot, everything just burns up, rain stops, plants dry up. So finding food is difficult. Now the bees also collect what we call propolis. Uh, that, that word came from the fact that they, they use it around their uh, hive entrance to shrink it down so it's before the hive, before the people. Uh, these are plant resins, you know what I might call pine pitch, that they can collect off of uh, plant surfaces. And they bring this stuff inside the hive, and anywhere that there's a little crack or something like that, they seal that little crack. And uh, they glue all their boxes together. They glue the cover on the box. So when we as beekeepers go out and we want to work with the bees, we have to open these boxes and you sort of have to break in. They're glued shut. And that's generally the reason that we use a smoker, and there's a nice old smoker back there, as you can see, uh, to provide smoke. The smoke interferes with the alarm pheromone. It stops the guard bees from putting out the alarm pheromone, and it interferes with the soldier bees inside smelling the alarm pheromone. So that helps significantly. The other thing about propolis is they, they kind of, if they can do it, uh, line the walls of the hive with it, and they get some of it on the combs, and when we've got frames in here, they get it on the wood on the frames and all this sort of thing. And it is an absolutely wonderful antibiotic. Uh, you name the microbe, and propolis will generally take care of it. And this is probably good, because the best defense that the honeybees can muster against being attacked by viruses and bacteria and fungi and whatnot is pretty meager. Honeybees really don't have very many genes in their repertoire to put out these chemicals that, that protect them by, by interfering with the viruses and with the, with the bacteria and whatnot. And even, even the few little codes that they have are not replicated over and over and over and over and over again. So when you get attacked, you know, you can't just, you can't just turn on the immune system and, and smash these, these critters. So the whole idea is then to live in an environment where you're not subjected to these microbes too often. And so propolis is a big step in that. Obviously, not all colonies live. And so the bees would go extinct if they didn't somehow manage to reproduce. So swarming is what the colonies use for reproduction. And in theory, since the queen is supposed to live for more than a year, and she has a bunch of bees around her, this should just be a perpetual unit that goes on and on and on with, with just switching queens once in a while. Well, you know that doesn't happen, some of them die. So you, you reproduce to prevent extinction, and swarming is the way to do it. Um, swarming is not something that just happens at the drop of a hat. This is something that's sort of planned, if you wanted to use that terminology, although we don't think bees think about planning the way we might. And uh, they begin to taper back on feeding the queen so that she can fly, and that means she lays fewer eggs. They begin raising some new queens. Now, in this particular case, the queen pheromone may be okay. And it's, it's not that they're going to get rid of the old queen, but they want new ones. So they rear these new queens. And as that's going along, uh, queens are reared in a 
Somebody may show you this picture. In a, in a cell that sticks out of the comb and then hangs down like a peanut. And once, once it's been capped, once the larvae have made it, it's pretty sure there's going to be a pupa and there's going to be a replacement queen. Then the old queen and half the bees leave to set up shop somewhere else. And that would give you two colonies if it works. And Brian's not going to talk about that today, but that's fascinating how they do that. <laughs> okay, once they leave, they tend to fly not too far, but a distance away. And unless they're lucky, they don't know exactly where they're going to live next. So they stop somewhere and form what we refer to as a cluster. They all group together. And there are some leader bees, and the queen comes in with them. She's not leading it, but she's coming along. And while they're in the cluster, a few individual bees will fly out. They might get a little food, they might get a little water. You never know how long that cluster is going to be there. But there are a bunch of scout bees looking for a new place to live. And then they will come back and they will communicate what they have found in their manner. And uh, eventually, somehow or another, they come to a decision and whoosh, off they go to the new location. Now, the thing is, not many people other than beekeepers are fascinated by seeing swarms flying in the air <laughs> and landing in trees in their backyard. That bothers them, okay? I'm certain that you're aware that many, 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 many places that prohibited beekeeping have had those restrictions eliminated and now a whole bunch of people are keeping bees. If the people don't pay attention to what's going on, if swarming happens, if they go out and work their bees at the wrong time, if they've got cranky bees that tend to sting and the neighbors start getting sting, stung and the neighbors' dogs and the neighbors' kids and whatever, those restrictions are coming right back. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to be a big keeper, really, if, if you're going to do it. Okay, now, what if they don't find a new hive place? Well, since they've taken a nice cross-section of all the bees in the hive with them when they go, the ones that were wax producers just start producing wax. And in fact, if you ever see a place where, where the bees swarm, formed a cluster in your backyard on a tree branch, but then in a day left, go out and look at the branch right there. You'll see wax on it. They can't help themselves. It's coming out. They've got to put it somewhere. If they don't find a better place to go, though, they just keep building wax right there. And before long, you're building what we call an exposed comb colony. And you'll just have, you'll just have the combs hanging right off of whatever they clustered on. Uh, generally, those won't make it through the winter. You've got birds that come around and pester them. You've got other robbing bees that come and pester them. Uh, the wind beats them up. The rain beats them up. But anyway, they're out there for a season, short season. So we have, uh, let's see, I only wanted to say one thing about honey because other people are going to be covered. Why did I say Brian Johnson? That's absolutely wrong. Look on your program. I got the wrong person in there. <laughs> Good job, Eric. Okay, uh, we will have a speaker discuss uh, the use of honey as a food, I guess historical, historical perspective. What I want to say is though that uh, the average consumption of honey in the United States is about a pound and a third per person. If you go to most people's houses and ask, where's your honey? They'll say, I don't have any honey. So obviously every family doesn't have a pound and a half that they consume directly off the table. So how do we consume this pound and a half? Well, you consume it in Honey Nut Cheerios, graham crackers, glazed hams, but you do on an average, not all of you, but most of you are going to consume about a pound of honey a year. The other thing that's interesting is that means that across the country we're consuming over 300 million pounds of honey. The U.S. beekeepers can only produce about 150 million this year, 170 million. They used to be able to produce between 200 million and 250. Our bees are in conditions now that they can't possibly do that. The forage is, is set up such that they can't do that anymore. So we have to import half of the honey that's consumed in the United States. And we have had some minor difficulties with that off and on. What about the uses of beeswax besides for combs for honeybees to live on? Well, it's a lubricant, it's an adhesive for industrial purposes. Uh, it's used in dentistry. You may have had these wax in your mouth from time to time that way. Uh, what good is venom? It hurts. 
Well, one of the things you can do is if, if you uh, happen to know somebody who's allergic to bee stings, usually those individuals can be desensitized, as we call it, by getting a bunch of venom shots, which is the same idea of allergy shots for hay fever. You just go in and get these shots, they start with a little, they add more, they add more. And you're trying to build up a protective antibody in your body so that when you get stung, the components in the venom that cause the trouble at your gamma E locations that cause you to really get sick, they'll get caught by the gamma G and flushed out of the system before that happens. Venom is also used for apitherapy. And it's really hard to get into apitherapy without uh, encountering proponents that advocate it so strongly that it would be hard to believe it doesn't work versus people on the other side who say, show me the data. I have never seen any data yet that shows that this stuff works. And by apitherapy, I'm talking about a person with a particular problem. And I'll just tell you about one because I can't tell you whether it works or not. I can just tell you what we've seen. Uh, multiple sclerosis is one of them. And it, even, even when the person's pretty well into it, occasionally they'll respond to bee sting therapy. And bee sting therapy for those poor people is about 20 to 30 stings three days a week. It hurts. But some of those individuals have significant remission. Some don't. It's like any other medicine that, that people try to use. Uh, but I can't get up here and uh, propose that because <laughs> I'm not a medical doctor, among other reasons. Uh, propolis. We know what it does inside the beehive. It's that, it's that super antibiotic. It's used a lot in tinctures, alcohol tinctures, and uh, various places in Europe and Asia. But it's not very typically used in our country. And our doctors won't prescribe it. They won't even say too much about it. But there was a fellow in Los Angeles that I met at a VB down there who had a little tin of propolis in his pocket. And he had some kind of a periodic problem with the circulation in his legs. And I have no idea, neither do the doctors, of why this happens or what happens. But he just, the, the blood doesn't flow quite right, circulation goes down, pain level comes up like crazy. And he used to have to go to bed and just hope for this thing to wear off. And he never knew whether it was going to wear off in a day or a week. Well, somebody said to him, I don't know where this came from. Well, you should try propolis. And he said, what do you mean try propolis? Well, get some from a beekeeper. And, and when you begin to feel this thing coming on, just put it under your tongue and let it dissolve. Well, they're resins. They don't dissolve very fast. But interestingly, so he's carrying it around in his pocket. And I said, how does it work? And he said, since I have had this, anytime I feel it coming on, I put it under my tongue and it just doesn't happen. It's wonderful. Now, is this placebo? Beats me. But it works for him. So, if you want to get some of these peculiar uh, medicines and whatnot, you can get them from the Oriental supermarkets. They've got them. Okay, besides honey, what's important to bees? Well, to us here, honey, uh, bee, honeybees are, are very important to us from the standpoint of pollination because approximately one third of what you're going to consume here today and we consume every day is dependent upon honeybee pollination, and particularly the uh, health foods, the, the fruits, the vegetables, and things that are supposed to be really good for you. So therefore, my conclusion is that honeybees are truly marvelous. Thank you. Are there questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, the, the question is, um, if, a, if a bee might go as far as four miles away, what, what, if, what if it encounters a hill? Or what if it encounters some other thing that might block what it's doing? Um, yes, it does interfere to a certain extent because there are some places where a, um, an apiary over on this side of a hill does a very good job of, of getting the honey from that area around there. There's another apiary on this side of the hill and they haven't got any local honey and they don't go over and penetrate the other side. So to a certain extent, yes. But um, actually, you don't, you don't really stop honeybees or other bees, for that matter, from flying just because something high is around. Because I was in Boston one time at the top of one of those skyscrapers where there's a restaurant at the top. And I noticed these big 
things kind of flying around outside. I couldn't figure out what was going on. When I looked closer, it was bumblebees. I don't know, we were up 27 floors or something like that. So really you can't, no, there's, there's no upper limit as such. You can't build a fence out there and say, bees, you're staying on this side. That, that doesn't work. They'll, they'll go over it if there's something worth going to on the other side. Yes? She's asking about the transition of, of worker bees, which have a lot of what you and I would call food preparation chemistry. And then during the time that they're feeding the brood and whatnot, that's what, what, that's what they're like. But as they get older and become foragers, their body chemistry changes completely. And that food preparation stuff is gone. And now they've got a different mechanism, which isn't nearly as protective of, of their longevity. And so under those circumstances, they are going to forage for until an accident happens or maybe three weeks, max, or something like that. And then they just basically die of old age. They just run out of steam. And there were some other things that were studied. Uh, the flight activity. There's enzymes in there, and it, those enzymes do not replace themselves. So after they put on so many miles, they haven't got the enzymes to fly anymore. And besides, you take a look at those old bees, and they're all tattered. Their hair is gone, and the back of their wings are all ripped up. I mean, they're not efficient anymore. So that takes care of that part. And then your second question was dealing with... What happens to the drones when they die of old age? Oh, what happens to the drones when they die of old age? Uh, I, I guess it's like any other bee. You don't see accumulations of a lot of dead bodies of bees around hives at all. So what happens is when these bees are on their last flight or whatever the world is going on, it's an away flight and they don't come back. That's, that's just how we lose the adults and everything else. Now, as they kind of fall to the ground, they're not dead. They're still alive. So if they land in a neighbor's pool, if they land in your lawn, if they land wherever, people might be walking around barefoot. You step on one or you hit one in the pool, it can still stink. They're not in the pool to drink water, but they do flutter down wherever they happen to be at the end. And they're not dead yet. They will be shortly, but they're still capable of stinging. Oh, what, what the soldier bees do? To my knowledge, soldier bees just stay soldier bees until they're no longer really functional and they fly off and disappear somewhere. Yeah. Yes? Uh, how do I prevent swarming? And is swarming a problem during the winter months? Okay, the question is how do you prevent swarming and is swarming a problem in the winter months? I'll take the second one first. Usually not is the answer to that. Normally it's not a problem. And Dr. Norman Gary sitting here in the back is going to talk about beekeeping and he's going to tell you all of that. So there won't be a question in your mind about how to prevent swarming and there'll never be another swarm again from any of you sitting there. Okay, there was a question in the back. Yes, sir. So we have one very aggressive hive. Yes. And uh, my daughter comes regularly to the hive and her or whatever. The bees collect around and they chase me for easily a couple hundred feet. So what's going on there? Okay. The question is, uh, how come how come generally the bees aren't chasing everybody around? But I've got this one colony out there that they chase me all over the place. Could be two reasons. One of them you're not going to believe, but that doesn't matter. There are some people who have gotten in touch with me who said, you know what? I don't know what happens, but I can be out in the middle of a parking lot at a football game, and a damn wasp will come and sting me, and they don't come and they don't sting anybody else, and it happens again and again and again. Okay, I don't quite understand that. Can't explain it, okay, but it happens. So there may be something about your physiology, and I don't think you smell like a banana, but something, uh, that actually induces that response. And I can believe that might be a possibility. The second thing is, if you have a colony that really can't behave itself, it has to be requeened with better stock. And so you would normally go to a commercial bee breeder or something like that and get yourself, or, or one of your neighbor bee keepers if they've got them, Sooner or later, you know, there'll be some, like, queen cells, and you can go into that nasty colony, which isn't any fun. Take the old queen out, put the queen cell in, and then, with a little luck, she'll emerge, get mated, and take over. And then, then still, the bees that are kind of persnickety are going to be in there, you know, for that six-week lifespan. But they'll be being replaced by ones, and, and you'll just see a, a gradual mellowing out of the colony, I hope. Way back, yes.
Um, I go with the app to Norm again. Norm's going to talk about beekeeping. The question was, what's the technique for moving the hive just small distances or moderate distances or long distances? Norm, Norm should be able to cover that. I got enough time for maybe one more question. Right? Yes, sir. The question is propolis. Uh, is, it, is it worth trying to uh, harvest and sell as a, a high product or something like that? If the answer appears to you to be yes, because there is a company called Propolis USA that buys it, okay. Uh, what the beekeepers normally do is they have a plastic rectangular device with little slots cut in it. They're too small for bees to get through. They're just the right size to make the bees want to propolize. So they'll put that in the colony somewhere and the bees will fill it all up. And then you've got this gooey, sticky stuff all over the place. You stick it in the freezer and get it really, really, really cold. And then you just torque it and then it all pops off. And then you can collect it and sell it to Propolis USA if you want. Uh, you're not going to get a whole lot for a high. But you get a lot more if you have to be in an area where you're near the woods versus being out here in Davis or something like that. But if you've got it off the edge of the woods somewhere where they can get into a lot of that pine pitch or whatever you want to call it, the rest of the materials leaking out of trees. That works. And I heard a buzzing in the stump once when I was up in the SCRs and I thought, that, man, that's honeybees. And I grabbed my camera and I started running over. There must be a colony down around the base of that stump. It's one of those big stumps. You know? And I got closer and looked around and oh, there's no flight in and out anywhere. I'm like, what is going on here anyway? They were on it and it was kind of freshly cut, but not newly cut. The tree was gone. And it was still oozing. They were in there. That Pitch resin off of that tree stump. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm going to be back in the afternoon later for more questions if you think of them by then. Thanks.